Good evening and welcome to our Sunday evening services tonight. We've been in the Gospel of John chapter 1 for quite a long time. Uh, Lord willing, we'll finish that chapter tonight so that then Wednesday we will uh, pick up with the first part of John chapter 2. In our study of John chapter 1, we began with looking at the prologue, verses 1 through 18. We pointed out that in those verses, John introduces to us a lot of subjects or themes he's going to develop throughout the rest of the gospel account. We also pointed out several characteristics of the word. It was mentioned in verses 1 through 4, and then in verse 14, it is said of him that he became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, John says, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. We find that that then, of course, is the theme for the rest of the gospel accounts. It's the revelation, the uh, record of the life of Jesus the Christ, the second person of the Godhead, God become flesh. Then we looked at the interview of John the baptizer by the uh, messenger sent by the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem. They went out to see him and to ask him who he is. Are you the prophet? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the Christ? And of course, before they could even ask that question, John says, I am not the Christ. Well, who are you then? We need to give an answer to those who have sent us. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, making straight the way of the Lord. He told them that after himself, someone else would come, even though he was coming after him, chronologically, he was before him in rank as well as in existence. And he said that he is greater than I am. Then he saw Jesus the next day and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we spent a lesson looking at that idea, the concept of the Lamb of God, both in its Old Testament background as well as all of the various nuances that John's audience, his original audience, would have had in mind. Then we looked at several character studies, uh, not only the character of John himself, but also the character of Andrew and the character of Simon Peter, and the character of Philip. And tonight we're going to come to a study of a character by the name of Nathaniel. Now, before that, we also had a lesson on the word Eureka, because several times in the paragraph we find where the word is used in the Greek language, it's translated for us as found or find, uh, how Jesus found Philip and called him. Uh, Andrew, when he went and first found his brother Simon, and brought him to Jesus. And uh, that word found is, is, uh, occurs several times. Rika is the uh, original word there. And truly when we find something that is of exceptional value, a lot of times we'll use that word Eureka, I have found it. But when we find Jesus Christ, we find that which is of surpassing value. But tonight we're gonna to be looking at John chapter one, beginning at verse 45 and going down through verse 52, and if you, uh, verse 51 rather, and if you would turn with me, we'll just read these several verses together before we look at this study of a man by the name of Nathaniel. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, if you have your outline that we posted online, or perhaps if you're one of the members of Mountain Home Church of Christ, you got it in the bulletin. Actually, you didn't get this one in the bulletin. That was only this morning's that you get in the bulletin. If you uh, have it from the uh, Facebook page, you'll see that our lesson tonight is actually Nathaniel slash Bartholomew. We're not studying about two different disciples here, but as we look at the uh, gospel accounts, 
I think that we'll find that this one apostle is known by both of these two names. For example, if you look at the list of the apostles in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, Mark chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, Luke chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, and Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. You'll find that Bartholomew's name appears after Philip's, except in Acts, where Thomas comes between uh, Philip and Bartholomew. John never mentions this man by the name of Bartholomew, and the other writers never mention a man by the name of Nathaniel. So it's kind of interesting that here we have a man in John chapter 1 introduced to us as one of this select group that we're introduced to very early here in the first chapter, and yet his name isn't found in the other gospel accounts. And yet we do have Bartholomew found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the book of Acts, and yet he's not found anywhere in the Gospel of John. But it just seems kind of strange that you have this anomaly. And yet when we gather or look at some of the facts and gather them together and draw some conclusions, it seems like the uh, fact of the case is that Bartholomew most likely was a surname. That is, that was a second name that was given to this man. And it means, it from the Aramaic, it means son of Tolmai. For example, if you look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 17, you'll find there that Jesus addresses Simon. He says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. The expression Bar-Jonah simply means son of Jonah. In the Hebrew, it's, it would have been Ben-Jonah. In Aramaic, the phrase for son is Bar, B-A-R, son of Jonah or son of John. Then also, when you look over, for example, in Acts chapter 13 and verse 6, you find there that Paul came up against a false prophet, a Jewish false prophet, and he was Bar-Jesus, that is, son of someone who had the name of Jesus or Jesus. And then later we find in verse 8 that his name was Elymas. So his given name was Elymas, but if there were other Elymases around, it would be known as, well, he's the, the Elymas who is the son of Jesus. Well, if there were other Nathaniels around, Nathaniel would also be then the one who was known as Bartolmi, or as it comes out in English, Bartholomew. So most likely we're looking at the same man here, Bartholomew in the Synoptic Gospels and Acts, and then Nathaniel here in the Gospel of John. So as we're looking at this man, Nathaniel, let's notice several things that we can learn from this great character. And first of all, notice Nathaniel and the scriptures. Nathaniel and the scriptures. Philip's announcement, he comes to him, he says, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now we talked about this a little bit the other night when we were talking about Philip. But this is what he says when he comes to Nathaniel. We found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, for Philip to make that announcement to Nathaniel emphasizes the testimony of the scriptures to the Messiah. Now, earlier we've seen, if we've read uh, consecutively in the gospel accounts, here we're in John chapter 1. If you go back just one chapter to Luke chapter 24, Jesus had done the same thing. After his resurrection, when he was walking on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples, remembered he. Uh, opened their minds. He said, this is what was written in the law and the Psalms and the prophets concerning me. And then later in the same chapter of Luke 24 to the apostles, he opened their understanding and taught them the things that were written in the law and the prophets concerning him. The scriptures bear testimony to Jesus. The Old Testament is like Jesus' DNA. We used to say it was like his fingerprints, but we can get even more specific. It's like his DNA identifies him as being the Christ, the Messiah, the long expected and anticipated fulfillment of God's promise to his people. Then we also need to realize that Philip must have known that Nathaniel was a student of the scriptures, and that he also was anticipating the one who should come. Remember we pointed out that when Andrew first met Jesus, when he went and found his brother Simon, he said, we found the Messiah. Now we're seeing all these references to the scriptures. 
The Messiah was one who had been expected and anticipated for generations. Remember we said that there was a 400 year period of silence regarding inspired prophecy from the end of Malachi to the opening up of the New Testament time. And so this anticipation was building and growing. The people were yearning and longing for this coming one. And for Andrew to make that announcement to Simon and now for Philip to make this announcement to Nathaniel, it indicates that these were people who were steeped in the scriptures. These were people who were wanting and longing for this coming Messiah. But then notice also both Philip and Nathaniel, as well as Andrew, as we said earlier, and an unnamed disciple who had been with John and also heard John say that concerning Jesus, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But uh, Philip, Nathaniel, Andrew, the unnamed disciple, and Philip, or a Peter rather, were all in the vicinity of John the baptizer when these things were transpiring. Uh, they all apparently had been uh, coming to be baptized by John, and perhaps they were followers of John up until this time. Remember, it was two of John's disciples. We find later one of them was Andrew. Two of his disciples who heard him say concerning Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, they followed Jesus. Then they were following Jesus from then on. They no longer were disciples of John. Now they were disciples of Jesus. And if you remember when we were studying that a few uh, lessons ago, we pointed out from John chapter three that somebody came to John and said, look, the man that you were talking about, his disciples are now baptizing even more than you are. Remember his response was, well, he must increase, but I must decrease. Someone has said that one of the greatest illustrations or one of the greatest examples of a gospel preacher is John, because when people heard him speak, they followed Jesus. And that is exactly the work of a preacher. They're not to build a following for themselves, but they're build a following for Jesus Christ. So Nathaniel and the scriptures. The second thing we need to notice, though, is Nathaniel's scornful skepticism. He was a scornful skeptic when he first heard this Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. His question to Philip indicates that there's a note of uh, just almost unbelief here. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? There are several possibilities about the background of that question. We don't know exactly why Nathaniel uh, says this, but several possibilities present themselves. One is that it may have been due to a simple rivalry between Cana and Nazareth. Uh, we find that Nathaniel was from Cana in Galilee, but uh, Cana and Nazareth were not all that far apart. Neither one of them were very significant towns or cities. Uh, they were what would probably be known as villages at that time. Uh, they were in the shadow of some other larger cities, but probably nothing much ever happened in those towns and nobody great had ever come to them. And they may have been rivals. Uh, here in uh, north central Arkansas, there's quite a rivalry in sports at least, between Mountain Home and Harrison, uh, other places where I've lived. We always have our rivals between towns or between schools and things like that. Maybe there was some kind of rivalry between the two towns. Maybe, well, there really isn't any other uh, evidence of this, but perhaps Nazareth just didn't really have a great reputation. Maybe this was how a lot of people felt about the town of Nazareth, that uh, not necessarily mean and bad people, but just nothing ever really, really good or great came out of that town. Or a third possibility is that it may have been due to a lack of scriptural links between the town of Nazareth and the Messiah. Uh, there were scriptural links to Bethlehem. There were scriptural links to the area around the Sea of Galilee, as we read in Matthew chapter four, looking back to Isaiah chapter nine. Uh, there are several scriptural links there, but there weren't many scriptural links as far as Nazareth was concerned. And so perhaps because Nathaniel was a student of scripture, he understood some of those things and would be surprised or at least skeptical at first regarding a Messiah, uh, one spoken about by Moses in the law and also by the prophets having come out of the town of Nazareth. At any rate, this is his initial response. 
And if you remember the other night when we were talking about Philip, we pointed out that Philip used some very great psychology here. Didn't argue with Nathaniel, didn't try to talk up the town of Nazareth or anything like that. He simply said, come and see. Just come and see this man, come and see Jesus. That's all that he needed to do in order to be convinced. And I believe that that's still one of the greatest and most effective means, and really the only effective means of evangelism, is to get people to come to the New Testament and see Jesus as he's revealed here. Come and say, don't argue. Just let them see for themselves. Let them read the account for themselves. Let them study it for themselves. Help them, of course, as they need it. Let them make up their own mind regarding Jesus and who he is. Well, the third thing we needed we need to notice then is, and by the way, the attitude that uh, Nathaniel indicates here is really something of a foreshadowing of the skepticism we're going to see in another man by the name of Thomas. And that's going to manifest itself over in John, the 20th chapter, when Thomas has uh, to say, you know, unless I see the print of the nails in his hands and put my hand into the side where the spear thrust was, I will not believe. Well, Nathaniel kind of begins that way as he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, notice the way then that Jesus greets Nathaniel. Notice Jesus greeting. As Philip is bringing Nathaniel to him, Jesus sees them coming and he says, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Now, it's interesting that Jesus would use that word deceit, and especially in connection with an Israelite. It may take us all the way back to the book of Genesis. The reference to deceit may look back to the fact of the birth of Esau and Jacob, the twin sons of Isaac. Because if you remember, Esau was born first. But when Jacob was born, he had hold, he had grabbed hold of the heel of Esau. And that's how he got his name, Jacob or Yaakov. It means simply one who was a heel grabber or by extension, who was a deceiver. And then, of course, it also could refer to verses 29 to 34 as those boys grew. Uh, Jacob was one who kind of liked to stay around the house and his mother took a special interest in him. Esau was a, a man of the outdoors and he liked to do the hunting and all. And Esau came in from hunting one time. Uh, Jacob was around where the food was, and Esau was famished. And he said, give me some of that red bean stew that you have there. And Jacob said, what's it worth to you, in essence, and kind of paraphrasing here, and anyway, bargained for him for the birthright. That is the right of firstborn. Because remember, even though they were born only a matter of minutes apart, Still, that was significant because in the ancient world, the right of primogeniture or the right of the firstborn carried a lot of significance. Jacob bartered the red bean stew to Esau in exchange for Esau's birthright and kind of was deceitful in doing that. But then, of course, the greatest deceit comes in Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 45, where even at Rebekah's insistence, Jacob helps to deceive his father Isaac to get the blessing that also went to the firstborn son. So you see that in a lot of his dealings, Jacob was indeed, he lived down to his name. His name meant deceiver, and he lived down to that name. He actually practiced those things. Now later, of course, his name would be changed to Israel over in Genesis chapter 32, but that came later, and it came really after he met a man who was as great a deceiver, if not more so, than he was, his own uncle Laban, his mother Rebecca's brother. But Nathaniel is surprised at Jesus' greeting because the greeting is almost as if Jesus already knows him. And as a matter of fact, that's the question that Nathaniel asks. He's surprised here. He says, how do you know me? In other words, Nathaniel has never laid eyes on Jesus before. He has never seen him before. He's heard about him for the very first time a few moments ago from his friend Philip, who has brought him to Jesus. How do you know me? And Jesus says, for Philip called you. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, again, Nathaniel is just flabbergasted. And to us, we might kind of be somewhat 
puzzled here why Nathaniel would go to the lengths and make the statements that he makes. But he says, when, when Jesus says this, Nathaniel most likely is going all the way back, thinking again, if he's a student of scripture, like we believe that he must have been, thinking back to Psalm 139. And if you would look back to the opening expressions of Psalm 139, you'll find there that uh, the psalmist here says, and the psalmist is David, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. It may very well be from what we're going to see in a few moments of what Nathaniel says. Nathaniel is seeing in Jesus, when Jesus makes this statement to him, that Nathaniel is seeing here, attributing to Jesus, the same qualities that David is attributing to the Father, to God. God knows all about him. There's nothing that he can do. Later in Psalm 139, David says, there's no place where I can go to flee from your presence. If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I descend into Sheol, you are there. No place can he go to get away from God and God's knowledge of him. And it seems that Nathaniel is saying that concerning Jesus. Jesus, just by that one statement, Nathaniel is seeing something here, perhaps more clearly than we do on the surface, that Nathaniel is seeing here in Jesus this quality of knowing all about him and having the quality of deity. And that's why he makes them the following confessions. First of all, he says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Well, first look at that word, Rabbi. That word is used several times through in the New Testament. And as we see it oftentimes applied to Jesus. It simply meant master teacher recognizing Jesus as a master teacher. Now, the word was often used by the disciples early in John's gospel. But as we go on through the gospel, we're going to find that it's replaced by the word Lord as their knowledge and experience of Jesus grew through their association with him. They recognize that yes, he is a master teacher. A lot of people today are willing to recognize Jesus as a master teacher. They're willing also to stop there and leave it at that. But friends, when we really come and see Jesus, when we really examine things carefully, Jesus doesn't really leave us with that option. He wasn't just a good man and just a great teacher. He made claims that go far beyond that. And if those claims are not true, then he's neither a good man nor a great teacher. We have to really make up our minds. Are we going to be like the disciples and grow? From seeing Jesus as the rabbi, the master teacher, and then see him as Lord? Or are we going to stay stagnant, seeing him as a great teacher and not move on? And really, that's not an option that Jesus gives us. He intends for us to see him as more than just a teacher. Great teacher, absolutely. None greater. But that's not all there is to Jesus the Christ. He says, you are the son of God. Now, where did this come from? Where does it come from that Nathaniel would say this? Well, if you look back to John chapter 1 and verse 34, just a few verses before this, you remember that John the baptizer, when he is giving testimony concerning Jesus, he says, now, I did not recognize him. I did not know him as this, but the one who sent me to baptize told me that on whomsoever I should see the spirit descend in the form of a dove and remain on him, this is the one. And he says in verse 34, and I have seen and have borne witness that this is the son of God. Already John, the baptizer, has confessed Jesus as the son of God. Now here we find that Nathaniel is doing the same thing down here in uh, John 1 and verse uh, 49. Then he doesn't stop there. He says, you are the king of Israel. King of Israel. Now, where did this come from? Well, again, it's wrapped up in that title of Messiah. 
As uh, Andrew had said to Peter, we have found the Messiah. Philip doesn't use that word, but he's certainly implying it when he says the one of whom Moses in the law and all the prophets wrote. So this word Messiah, the anointed of the Lord, it goes back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, prophets were sometimes anointed. Kings were anointed. Priests were anointed. And we find, of course, that Samuel, uh, the last of the judges and the bridge between the judges and the kings, first anointed Saul, the son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin, to be the first king of Israel. Then he anointed David, the youngest son of Jesse, to be the second king of Israel. And when David was being pursued by Saul, remember there were a couple of different occasions where he had the opportunity that he had, had he so desired, and his men following him were urging him, go ahead and take Saul's life, go ahead and kill him. And David's response was, I will not lift up my hand against the Lord's anointed, the Lord's anointed one. He had been specially chosen, and Samuel the prophet had anointed Saul to be the king over Israel. Now, God relented. God was sorry that Saul turned out the way that he did. Samuel was very, very greatly distressed over the uh, obstinacy of Saul and his uh, rebellion. But David would not lift up his hand against the Lord's anointed. But that was a way of referring to the king over the people. And the Messiah whom they were expecting here in the first century was descended from David. This was prophesied in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and also in Isaiah chapter 9 and Isaiah chapter 11 and many other places as well. Ezekiel chapters 34 and 37. Many different places have reference to this Messiah, this coming king being descended from David and inheriting the throne of his father David as the angel Gabriel announced to Mary in Luke chapter 1 regarding the birth of that son that she would uh, conceive and give birth to. But Messiah, king. Now, you see, Nathaniel has moved from his rabbi, the son of God, king of Israel. And Jesus, Jesus makes a promise. First of all, Jesus gives a commendation of Nathanael's faith. He, is, uh, he says, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? In other words, is this all it took? You're going to see even greater than this. And these are the promises that Jesus makes. He makes the promise that Nathanael would uh, see uh, greater things than these. He said, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, we see that again as a reference back to Genesis, back to Genesis chapter 28. Uh, remember the uh, reference to an Israelite in whom is no guile or no deceit. And now it's reference to the fact of angels going up and down, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Remember when Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau after having cheated him first from his birthright and then from the blessing, his mother was sending him up to uh, Mesopotamia or Paddan Aram to get a wife. Remember, he came to Bethel and he laid down there. He had only a pillow, a, a stone for his pillow. And he laid down, but in a vision, he saw angels going up and down a ladder from heaven and back. And he awoke and he said, this is the house of God. And he named it Bethel, meaning house of God. And he built an altar there and made a promise to God. Well, Jesus is referring to that here, that this is going to be something that's going to be happening even with him. And Nathaniel, you're going to see this. You're going to see it. You're going to see greater things than just me telling you that I saw you when you were under the fig tree. It's more than just my knowledge of you and your day-to-day -day activities. You're going to see even greater things than these. And what Nathaniel did live to see was Jesus Christ raised from the dead. We've mentioned this in our series on Sunday mornings on the resurrection. But if you remember over in John chapter 21, here we find Nathaniel's faithfulness. John chapter 21, because in John chapter 21 and verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon said, I'm going fishing, etc. This is the last of the resurrection appearances recorded by John 
in the fourth gospel. Interesting that we read of Nathaniel only in the gospel of John, and we read of Nathaniel only in the first chapter and the last chapter. We don't know a whole lot about him otherwise, except here we find he's from Cana in Galilee. We find that Philip and him must have been acquainted. Philip is the one who searches out for him and brings him to Jesus. We find that he is uh, very greatly impressed with Jesus after at first being skeptical. And he was with him right to the very end and was right there with them when they saw the, uh, the risen Christ for the last time in John's account. And then, of course, as we said, he was also identified as Bartholomew in the other gospel accounts in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13, when the list of the men are listed, there is Bartholomew right there with them. And so he was indeed one who was brought to Jesus early, and he stayed till the very end, commending him for his faith. So Nathaniel could have been so prejudiced that he would never have given Jesus a second thought. But by accepting Philip's invitation to come and see, Nathaniel gained greatest blessing ever available. And friends, we need to be the same way. Rather than being prejudiced against Jesus, let's come and see. Let's examine the New Testament. Let's examine the gospel records. Let's examine the preaching in the book of Acts. Let's examine the principles and the letters of the New Testament. Let's see the victory of good over evil, of God over Satan, of Jesus over the demon, as we see in Revelation. Let's see all these great things. And let's be convinced that Jesus truly is the giver of life, the Savior of the world. We thank you for listening to our podcast tonight. We pray that you will have a successful week. Uh, we'll be back at 1030 Tuesday morning to continue our series on how to study the Bible. And then Wednesday night, we'll be back at 630 at our regular time for our Wednesday evening services. And we'll pick up with John chapter 2 at that time. Would you bow with me for a brief word of prayer as we're dismissed? Holy Father, again, we pause to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you again for men like Nathaniel and Philip and Andrew and Peter and John, all these that we read about here in this first chapter of John. Thank you for their willingness to see Jesus for who he is. And thank you for Jesus showing them who he is and through them, showing us who he is as well, so that we can have that faith and believing might find that eternal life that he came to give us. We pray for those who are suffering at this time. Many are suffering from illnesses. Many are suffering from loss of loved ones. Others are suffering from loneliness. Father, we pray that you would watch over and bless each one. We pray that you'll help to use us as your instruments of good toward those who are in need. Again, above all, we ask your forgiveness, and we ask every blessing and offer every thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Until Tuesday morning, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you.